<laughs> so, um, without further ado, this is so brilliant. I'm, uh, we're back in Merchant Tailors, the, uh, the, the great institution of Merchant Tailors, which I spent a lot of my life growing up in, just in Northwood, with, uh, when my dad was headmaster of Merchant Tailors. And as I mentioned, I think probably last time I was here, this uh, brings me back home. And uh, I remember my mum and dad sitting around here, sort of eating and drinking as honorary members of all sorts of clubs and things like that. So it's great to have you here. And good morning, your excellencies. We have lots of excellencies. We have lords, we have ladies, we have eminent professors, and we have some people who might be called gentlemen and some people who might think of themselves as otherwise. And you're all incredibly welcome. Uh, to this ninth edition of the Hogan Lovell's Africa Forum in person and here at MTS. Um, finally, and with thanks particularly, I think, will be lots of thanks as we're going, but to the team at Merchant Tailors for their forbearance over the last three years because uh, they've been great and it's lovely to be back. Um, our theme this year is Africa on the move, which obviously allows anybody to talk about whatever they like. And as ever, we have a galaxy of education, entertainment, expertise to present to you with leading commentators from all over the continent. Really, we have an incredible spread from all over the continent. Some of them have come to this rather later than others, but they're all fantastic. Um, and you won't agree with everything everybody says, I hope. Uh, but you will be challenged by some of it, uh, particularly the closing address, I think you'll find. Um, and if necessary, just challenge back. Um, I was recently really privileged to be invited to present the annual law lecture at Bradford University. And I know we have the eminent Professor Ngobo Emesa with, her with us today. So thank you, Professor, for that. And um, that was a first for me. I've never delivered a law lecture at a university and never attended a law lecture at university. <laughs> and as I mentioned at the time, I probably only attended four lectures uh, when I was at university at all studying what I was studying. But, uh, and there's a former colleague of mine from university here who can probably confirm that. And we both studied the same course, and I, but I think she probably did more lectures than I did. Um, but I was really proud going up there um, to see such an enthusiastic and incredibly diverse coming through into our profession. And to kick off today, I wanted to pick up a few of the themes which I, which I talked about then. I won't give you the whole 45 minutes. I'd had to do a 45 minute uh, lecture. And to be perfectly honest, I've never done more than about 10. And I wrote it all out and got going and thought this must be 45 minutes and it was 15. So I then had to go through the whole of my life, I think, and that just about got me to 45 minutes. But in my talk, I was talking, firstly, I was talking about the practice and role of law in the real world and the importance that law and especially the rule of law has in the world today, not as a theoretical, but a, a practical concept. And it's clear to me, I mean, look what's happening in Parliament here at the moment, that this importance increases day by day in a world where the fragility of institutions which underpin society and frankly, an autocratic tendency to bypass them is clear and where populist ideas, which can of course include unthinking criticism even of lawyers, can work intentionally or not to undermine those societal foundations. But there's also amazing opportunities to achieve things when you're informed, um, engaged and focused uh, with an inquiring and open mind. And I highlighted the importance, which I believe has universal application of accepting and embracing the fact that you mustn't make ethical assumptions and apply your own set of learned values indiscriminately and unthinkingly to others if you want to make, get anywhere. And how you need a broad cultural approach and an understanding and balanced approach, not only to achieve a just solution, which we're all talking about in Africa at the moment, but also an effective solution to global uh, and day-to-day -day commercial issues alike. Um, you might like, call it, maybe you need to adopt um, personal mental decolonization, perhaps, on a personal level, which I think is the phrase of today. So in essence, it's a complicated world with complex problems and different but valid value systems operating contemporaneously within it. Um, and it's increasingly the case, which is what is really obviously good to one person, business, generation, or culture, is equally and obviously bad to another whether in terms of ethics or simple practical outcomes. 
And the challenge the world faces at the moment is to find a balance to this which delivers a beneficial solution mutually within the constraints and principles of one's own personal and professional values, unless you just want to start a war or something like that. So simple disagreements can develop polarization from, from cooperation and selfishness from making a difference to others. Something highlighted at a talk um, we hosted recently with Paul Pullman, um, the former CEO of Unilever and generally good person, I believe, when he asked, um, is the world better off because I'm in it? It's a good question. I've run my practice, and this practice, as people will know, on four pillars. Um, understanding first. We've got to listen. We've got to understand more about what we do and not assume knowledge. We're good at that, I think. Um, investment. Without having the skin in the game, you can't properly deliver. Operation. We want to work on the ground with people we advise. And finally, and most importantly, and I think really important for me, respect. And that goes from respect for culture, other people, other people's views, and even, as I point out to my junior lawyers sometimes, people who aren't lawyers, because uh, they may have some different views from you sometimes, but they know business in a better way than most lawyers. So before I start, I wanted to outline just four, four examples of where I think this complexity is, and which will be picked up during the course of today, I know. So climate. Um, I attended COP26 in Glasgow. Um, Janet Rogan's here, who was running that, I believe, mostly on behalf of the UK government in Africa. Um, the need for action and urgent change, rightly highlighted, highest level, good words spoken, good documents signed. And I think, generally speaking, it was considered to be good. And this is uh, an area you might hope that we would have global alignment uh, before we're all boiled, frankly. So we all support a transition from carbon to renewables and a move away from coal, oil and gas, and as soon as possible. But, and we'll be talking about this, I hope, today, look at the reality of the situation on the ground in less developed countries. And you find an immediate and equally urgent set of needs, which in the short term may well be argued to outweigh even the COP arguments. I'm sure we'll see these raised and focused on at COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt this year, and then taken on into the Middle East at COP28. I don't need to dwell or judge the issue, but if you talk, as I do, to African leaders, they'll make a number of clear points. First, who caused the problems? That's the industrialized West, they would say. Second, who's mainly suffering the results? Well, that's the developing world. I mean, look at Mozambique and the Horn of Africa, for example. Third, what's, what transition are you really, really looking for? In Africa, uh, the transition isn't from gas to solar and renewables, it's from firewood and kerosene still used by 50% or 600 million, I believe, on the continent for heating and cooking. And 900 million people on the continent have no access to clean cooking. And if you add to that the fact that if Africa doesn't educate and actively industrialize its people across the board, the demographic time bomb in which 1.2 will become 2.5 anytime soon may explode with global impact. And without power, you can't industrialize and you can't get enough power from renewables. So what's obvious going back to the West as a solution, which can be set fair with legal and political rules, could lead, without understanding, to global failure. Of course, recent events in Ukraine have somewhat ironically refocused Europe on similar issues as we look to fire up our coal-fired power stations again. Um, it's complicated. Um, I think Mo Ibrahim put it quite succinctly when he said, you use Africa gas, tell us not to use African gas, and that's a morally indefensible position. Um, second, trade. Um, I don't think Al's here yet, but Al Long is until Friday last week. He was our trade commissioner acting. Um, UK, we've left the EU believing it's going to be better on our own to do individual deals, and actually we're doing quite a lot of individual deals. In parallel, on the same planet, more than 50 African countries have, in the meantime, entered into the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement designed to make all Africa tariff and barrier free. And Africa is supported 100% by the UK, and we've got a team in Accra, who I know quite well, putting in a dedicated time to do it, working with Wamkele Mene. Um, and you might say there's a germ of contradiction there, but everybody's entitled, as I say, to their own opinions. And stepping back, um, if you look a bit more closely, you could say, counterintuitively, that both the UK and Africa are essentially coming at this from the same point of view. 
Um, UK wanted to take back control. Africa and the African Union have for years been repeating the mantra that Africa should make things in Africa for Africa, and that value which is currently added outside Africa should be added in Africa for Africans, um, taking back control. We'll hear more of that today. Third, and briefly, politics and war. It's a challenge for global businesses with good and decent employees in different jurisdictions to operate and adjust their business um, in date changing times. We all have to work within the law and the rules and things in Russia are difficult. And it's, again, it's complicated. And I've been talking to a lot of people, again, in Africa about this. And again, the fact that what's obviously right to me isn't necessarily the case for, for those with a different historical experience and perspective. Um, a lot of countries including African countries, have been criticised for, should you say, not taking sides. I don't need to comment on that other than to say that talking to, if you talk to uh, leading politicians of a certain generation, um, they might point out to you that over the, off, they, you know, they've had a lot of support from certain countries, often side by side with them in the trenches, um, in their wards of liberation. And they've reminded us that uh, sometimes you need a historical perspective and understanding. Fourth, and something which is, I know, very close to, uh, for example, Afreksim's heart, um, and Samali Kiyingi in particular, I think, who's been talking later, uh, vaccinations. Um, COVID has challenged us all to work quickly and effectively to deliver solutions, which I think overall we've done. And there have been fantastic successes, and which are well documented. At the same time, just as we see with the climate debate, the um, exigencies of a situation have a tendency to move to move you to the one-eyed I think um, others have commented more eloquently than I on this but um, balancing a desperate and public demanded need to vaccinate your own country against the need to ensure vaccine availability globally which in itself is critical to your own country's future um, has created a lot of challenges, and when you add on to that national competitiveness about efficacy, which you know, Monsieur Macron was particularly good at, this is still challenging us all. So these are areas where, bear this in mind, not everybody has the same view, everybody has valid views, and you need to think about it. Um, I want to say, in final words, a, a few points about today and about us and me a bit. Uh, first, um, as many of you, it's been a sad, sad few weeks for our practice following the passing of our partner and, and my good friend, Kevin Peterson, from Joe Berg and St. Francis Bay. Kevin was a, a great lawyer, a good man, and a good friend. Hewn, as we put, might put it, from Kimberley. I first met him at the first one of these events where we stayed up late uh, with me on the piano, singing away and he on the beers and choosing the songs. Um, his expertise and dedication to clients was unsurpassed. And I've already said more than he would have wished, and he would most definitely have told me to walk it off, princess, is what he'd have said to me. Uh, but I wanted to say that. For me, I'm absolutely delighted to have been made chair of this practice and handed over all the work to Aaron uh, Velasami and Olivier Phil Lombi, who you'll see and hear around the place at our events. So two highly experienced Africa specialists. Um, I'm proud of the way we progressed our practice um, as a team over the last few years, and I want to acknowledge how fortunate I've been in able to not only promote our practice, but also in my various roles, a better understanding, I hope, of and engagement with Africa. Um, those who know me understand my passion for understanding Africa in all its infinite variety, and in trying to connect people on and off the continent to take things forward. Um, I think we don't have a representative of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art here today. We do, however, have Desta from the Royal Africa Society, whose CV is extraordinary. When I read it out later, I didn't even know half of what she'd done. Uh, we've got the South Africa Chamber with Sharon Constance in here, 154 with my, the amazing Toria El Glawi, who is also here, and lately with Her Majesty's Government on the Nigerian Economic Development Forum, and, and as I was co-chair with Al Long, who will be hopefully turning up later with, with the Mozambicans um, uh, on my panel, where, who I co-chaired the Africa Investors Group with, which I think I'm still co-chair of, but that all depends on the new guy in charge. Um, 
I felt a nice bookend and launch pad for my career was reached and my late mother, who I referred to earlier, wouldn't forgive me if I didn't mention it. Um, when I was privileged to be awarded an MBE recently in the Queen's Jubilee birthday honours list for my Africa work, which is a credit to everybody in our team. And the <laughs> Okay. Well, she'd have liked that as well. Um, so we're all on the move, and we need to move on. And as we say in our practice, by going forward, going far, we go far together. And if you go alone, you don't go anywhere. I think it's something like that. We've got a spectacular firecracker and event in whatever order it turns out, which will depend on who turns up when. Um, and if going back to the beginning, the world is complicated. To operate effectively in it, you need every day to seek to learn something new and not be suffocated by your own preconceptions or your narrow focus. Um, to understand and be effective, you've got to respect other views and listen and cultures and embrace them, even if you don't agree with them, because you always learn something, even if you disagree. You should try working in the A-team for a week and you'll realize that's the case. Um, so listen, think, and learn. And now, I think I have to say a couple of points. So that's my opening address. With that, take some time to familiarize yourself with the event platform. Use Google Chrome, otherwise you won't get in. But since you're all here, I don't care. I think there are people listening, so I do care about those who are listening very a lot. Um, and um, if you're, you're listening to this virtually, there's fewer of you here, which is marvelous, and I hope you're going to enjoy it. Um, I'd now like to welcome to the stage partner Akima Paul Lambert, I hope, who will introduce our opening panel. Ah, that's me done. So over, enjoy the day. It's fantastic. Lots of friends here. Ask questions, but realize I'm just going to be on the phone most of the time to Portugal trying to get my container out there. So 